Welcome to This is What Democracy Sounds Like. I'm Kevin Prang, and this is a program of the Metropolitan Congregations United. MCU is a community organization that brings together religious congregations, community groups, individuals to work for a common purpose, and that's to create a better life for all residents in the St. Louis region. We work at the intersection of race, economy, political power, gender, and the structures of oppression at work within us individually, within our organizations, and within the community. We are working towards building people's control of the government, building community control of the economy, and expanding the public sphere. Today, my guests are Jennifer Lohman of the St. Louis Area Voter Protection Coalition and Dr. Gina McClendon, the Director of Voter Access Engagement and the Financial Capability Asset Building Initiatives at the Center for Social Development at the Brown School at Washington University. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. So this is going to be a crazy year. Uh, with the pandemic in effect. And so we want to talk about voting today, specifically voting in the state of Missouri, where things can uh, change on a moment's notice, it seems like. Um, And I want to give a note to our listeners that we're recording this on July 15th, uh, but we're going to cover topics that concern both, both the August 4th and November 3rd elections in Missouri. So to start off, let us start with some basics. Uh, We are past the the date for August, but how far in advance of the election is voter registration in Missouri? Um, It's four weeks in advance of the election. So the voter registration deadline for the August election was July 8th, and the voter registration deadline for the general election will also be four weeks before the general election. And I think the most important thing that people in Missouri need to know is that if you move from one election jurisdiction to another, which is like moving from county to county or from the city to the county or vice versa, you are no longer a registered voter in Missouri and you have to re-register. That's not an address update. It is a re-registration. That's probably something that people get caught up in a a lot. That's a common mistake. So everybody needs to re-register if you move to a new county. Otherwise, you can update your address um, pretty much any time up to and including election day, as long as you're Um, in the right polling place. Okay, and for Missouri residents, for registering, for re-registering, for updating your address, is is that a simple process? Uh, Where does that need to happen? Uh, It it can be done um, pretty much anywhere, either on paper um, with a voter registration application that you get at a library or a voter registration drive. You can go online to the Secretary of State's website, And if you have a touchscreen device, you can actually register to vote online and complete the process. You'll have to use your finger or a stylus to sign the registration, but that's probably the easiest way to do it. And I think that it's also a way that election authorities like, because then they don't have to decipher your handwriting and, you know, all the information is right there kind of in an automatic format when it's sent to them. Okay. So uh, first time registration can actually be done online. Yes. If you have a touchscreen device, and I guess that would be an iPad, uh, a tablet, things along those lines. All or a right. phone. Or a phone, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Why is it important for, register, re, uh, for voters to check on their registration? And how do they accomplish that? I, I hear that message quite a, quite a lot. Yes, yeah, so it's important for them to, to just double check because there are several things that could happen to their uh, registration. So, for example, if they haven't participated in two um, presidential elections, they could be purged or taken off the, the, the voter roll. So that's one reason. And then sometimes just different kinds of mistakes happen. There's also uh, something that's called canvassing. And it was part of the Help America Vote Act, I think it was, where the, the state of Missouri, or all states had to have a whole system, a statewide system for voter registration. But part of the caveat with that is that um, canvassing had to happen. So back before computers, people from the Board of Elections would actually go door to door and knock to make sure that you still live there, that that was your address. So that's what canvassing is. Now they send a postcard to homes and they do it after um, a major election. And when you get that postcard, if you don't respond to it, um, then there's a, another process, and eventually you could end up in an inactive status, which doesn't mean you're un, that you're unregistered, you're just in an inactive status. And if you don't respond the next time around, you could be actually taken off the, the voter rolls. And, and people don't know that. 
And, and do voters get that card if they have not voted? Not necessarily. I, I think it's sort of a, a random kind of deal. So people that haven't voted as well as some people that do vote. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, Kevin, have you ever gotten a card in the mail and you kind of look at voter registration and said, oh, I'm already registered. And you just kind of toss it to the side. Well, you, you're supposed to respond to it. And that happens a lot. I, I, I did not know that. I've gotten the cards before the election from the, the local board of elections to remind me and to have right. that, but not after the election. Okay. Yeah. So I've had it before. Jennifer, you have, haven't you? Haven't you had that experience to get one? No. No, I haven't. Okay. And you had mentioned the purges. Um, it, th that's something that happens here in Missouri also. It's, it seems to have gotten a lot more press in other states. What, what kind of happens here in Missouri? Well, Missouri, I think, and Gina, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uses something called the ERIC system, where it's, you know, I, I think they wouldn't refer to it as a purge so much as I think the term is list maintenance, where they go through and check voter registration rolls against a number of data points to see if people have maybe moved out of state and registered somewhere else mm -hmm. or have moved within the state and registered somewhere else. So that's a way that they do what they call list maintenance. And so a person can be removed from the roles um, due to that type of uh, activity with the ERIC database. Right. And also they look to see if the data points that uh, Jennifer is talking about are those things like they, they check death, re death records, they check to see if you're in prison, um, you know, things like that. And then um, using that ERIC system. So that same ERIC system is shared with Oh, the last time I checked, about 16, 17 different states, I think, and it's, it's, they subscribe to it. And so it's a way of matching and making sure that if, if I live in Missouri, but I've moved to Florida, let's say, for example, then if I didn't tell Missouri that I'm living in Florida, then there, there are certain data points that they could check to see if I actually, you know, if I live in Florida, then they'll take me off the Missouri roll. In your experience and in, in, in what you've investigated, um, it, it, does this seem like a, a, a legitimate uh, a process or is this uh, one of the onerous processes that is weighing down our, our voter rights? There are two ways to look at it. I mean, it can be an onerous process because mistakes can be made. And, um, you know, if you have a very similar name to somebody else, I mean, there can be mistakes in the data matching. So that could cause a problem. On the other hand, you know, having the list maintenance is good in a way because you do want to have um, accurate voter rolls uh, just because it makes things go more smoothly. On election day, people are, are more likely to get the right notifications if, if they're information is up to date. So, I mean, it's, there's a kind of a, a couple different ways to think about that. So, and I mean, and, and St. Louis County, uh, for sure, tries real hard. Uh, they look at quite a few things. So, let's say, for example, they may have, um, they'll look at data, like post office data. So, if you had your address changed, they could look at that and, and check to make sure that the address matches. Um, there are a lot of different things. And so, let's say it's 100%, they're going to make sure at least 80% of those data points are matched before they take people off. Now, I can't speak um, in terms of what other um, Board of Elections does, but I know the St. Louis County does that. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. But it, does, yeah. it doesn't feel like it has, it's as aggressive as some other states have been. I think it was in North Carolina where anybody can challenge anybody else's individual voter registration it's, it, yeah. it hasn't got well i mean we they missouri still has that they do have challenge laws. they do they do that okay oh yeah yeah okay. now whether how often and when it's done and, and where it's done but yes i as a as a as a registered voter i can go to the to a poll on election day and just tell the election judge i don't think that person is supposed to be able to vote and they can you can actually challenge it if people are interested in learning more about that process specifically, there's a really great documentary out there called Rigged, and uh, it covers um, a number of voter suppression tactics, among, the, among them challenging voters, um, and I think it might have been in North Carolina, actually, that right. they told that story. So it's really a documentary worth watching for people who are interested in the means by which voter suppression occurs. There is something, um, Jennifer, help me remember, wasn't it something like 
50, 70, 30 million people were taken off the rolls for the 2016 election, some ridiculous amount. It, it was it was definitely in the high millions. And in some states like Georgia, it was a lot immediately before the election, plus some voter registrations didn't get processed. So that's, you know, one way that voter suppression occurs is, you know, through purges, challenges, and failure to process registrations in a timely manner, all of which are really out of the control of the voter. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that that's to reiterate that checking your registration is important mm-hmm. uh, and do it in a, a timely fa- fashion so you can get re-registered and, uh, if, if need be. And you had mentioned uh, some of the data points and one of the things you had mentioned was checking um, if people have gone to prison, and we want to re- reiterate that unlock the vote is a priority for MCU and trying to restore voting rights to those on parole and probation right now in Missouri. If you're on parole, parole and probation, you can pay taxes, have a job, things along those lines, but you cannot vote. So that's where we stand right now in Missouri. So just want to touch base on one of one of our hot issues with yes with right. but, but but to to highlight something you know if you are off paper you can register to vote and a lot of people don't know that a lot of people think that they are forever foreclosed from voting if they have a felony conviction so the the fact that they can vote when they're off paper is something that that you know we should get the word out on that right Okay, good. Thank you for that reminder. Mm -hmm. So as we talked about earlier uh, in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, what are the options for voting by mail and absentee voting? There's been some confusion on that this summer. So what's the latest and what do voters need to do? This is an unnecessarily complicated setup. All right. There are several options that people have. The first option is to go ahead and vote in person if you want to either vote absentee in person or vote on election day in person. If you want to vote absentee in person, you have to have an excuse to do so. Anyone can vote absentee on election day. Bearing in mind that there are fewer polling places now, um, not only because they had to remove some from places that were high risk, but because there's difficulty recruiting poll workers and just generally the number of, you know, absentee by mail requests has gone up considerably. So when someone, if someone does decide to vote on election day, they should definitely check their polling place because it will likely have changed. Now, when it comes to mail voting, so there are, two basic types of vote by mail in Missouri in 2020. One is absentee by mail, which has always existed, except now there's an extra excuse that somebody can use. So with absentee by mail, you have a number of options for excuses. Two of them are health related. What the first one is um, if you expect to be confined due to illness or disability, or you're a caregiver for someone who is, that's one uh, health related excuse you can use to apply for an absentee ballot. The second one is, you know, the so-called at risk for COVID if you have it, or if you're over 65, or if you have one of a number of very specific health conditions that the legislature has deemed puts you at risk for COVID. You can also get um, an absentee ballot based on that excuse. Neither of those would require you to have your absentee ballot envelope notarized. So that's the big issue. If it's a health related excuse on an absentee ballot, you do not have to have your ballot envelope notarized. All other excuses for an absentee ballot, like being out of town or being an election worker, you would have to have your absentee ballot envelope notarized. Now, if you don't fall into any of those excuse categories, uh, you can apply for what's called um, a a mail-in ballot, which is oddly different from an absentee by mail ballot. The the mail-in ballot is no excuse needed. Um, It can only be applied for in person or by mail, whereas most people know that you can get an absentee ballot application submitted by email or fax or by mail or in person. Those are all options. With the mail-in ballot, it's only in person and only by mail. And the other difference is also that um, obviously the ballot envelope needs to be notarized, but it can only be returned by mail. Whereas with an absentee ballot, you can return it by mail or drop it off at the election office or have a close family member do so. Mail-in ballot has to be returned by mail. Why is that important? It's important because ballots have bulk business class postage on them. So they're postage paid, 
but it's bulk business class. And that means it's very slow. Mail takes up to 10 days to make its way through the county if it's bulk business class. And that is super significant because under Missouri law, your ballot must be in the election office by 7 p.m. on election day. No excuses, no grace period, doesn't matter if the mail is slow or the mail screws up. If it's not there, that vote does not count. Um, So that is definitely a problem. In June, there were a number of ballots that were absentee ballots, and I guess they didn't have the mail in in June, but they had absentee by mail. A number of them were not counted because they arrived at the election board after 7 p.m. on election day. And that is an issue I think needs to be addressed. Right now, the League of Women Voters is recommending that if you can put a first-class stamp on your ballot when you mail it back in, you should, because that should speed things up. But folks do definitely need to know that's, that's just one of those things. There's no discretion, no second chance. It's either there or it's not. So it, well, I just want to repeat that because it's so important. We're, it, it's not a matter of the postmark. It's a matter of mm-hmm. when, when that ballot arrives at the election office. Exactly. Exactly. The postmark is irrelevant and it takes much longer than people think to get the ballot in. Now, just to to kind of piggyback on the ballots being rejected for being late, ballots can also be rejected if the ballot envelope is not filled out correctly, meaning it's not signed or the, um, the reason you're voting absentee isn't checked on it or your address verification isn't checked on it or if you require a notary, it's not notarized. Those are all reasons your ballot could be rejected and you won't necessarily be notified if that's the case. So I think it's really incumbent on voters if they want to double check to call the election office before election day after they've sent their ballot in to make sure that it was accepted and that everything was, um, was valid on the ballot. Okay. And this special mail in process is for Mm -hmm. this year only for August and November of this year, correct? Exactly. As a reminder too, with absentee voting, you can actually go and vote in person Mm -hmm. using absentee ballots. So for example, for the August 4th election, people were able to start going in person to the Board of Elections office on June 23rd. I've been able to do that when I'm traveling for work and that that has been Mm -hmm. a a great way to do it. It's simple. Uh, There, I've never experienced a line doing that and you're usually in and out pretty quickly. Uh, And right now those those offices are open despite the pandemic, correct? Yes, they're, they're open, and, I, and St. Louis County has or will shortly also offer absentee voting in person at some satellite locations in various parts of the county. So that's an option for voters in St. Louis County. Oftentimes, you know, absentee in person only occurs at the main election office in a county, but St. Louis County does offer satellite locations. Okay. And with the, with the uh, notarization, uh, you said if you have the health excuse for these two votes only, notarization is not required. Um, that notarization can be a burden on folks. What types of things are you guys doing to, to sort of alleviate that? Well, we've become notaries. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, there's actually a, a notary hub, and I don't know the actual website you can go to, but there's a place where people can go put their information in. If they Either if they want to become a notary, they'll get information. If they're willing to serve as, as a volunteer notary on certain dates, they can do that as well. Um, so, yeah. so the hub right now doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's like a Google sign up. Um, so right now the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition and the ACLU have filed suit to try to get the notary requirement overturned as being, you know, burdensome and not particularly safe during the pandemic because it is a high touch kind of thing. I mean, have, I am a notary. I've notarized people's uh, all kinds of different things and, you know, you have to handle their ID. It's not unlike voting in person. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, is that really the smartest thing to do during a pandemic is require people to engage in a very high touch transaction in order to have their ballot be valid. Um, So the lawsuit is going on thus far, they have not been successful. And I think you have to assume that the notary requirement will definitely be in place completely for the August election. Um, The Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, which is headed by Denise Lieberman, is an organization that has set up the notary hub statewide. 
to do what Gina said and, you know, kind of connect notaries and notary events. And if people want to get information from the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, you can text MOVPC to 66866 and get on their email list to get that information about the notary hub. And yes, you know, we're, we're trying to promote other people's notary events. We're trying to put together some of our own, like Webster Groves is going to have notary events at public parks the next two Saturdays. Um, Tower Grove Park, uh, the, the farmer's market is going to have notary events. A lot of churches are having them. And I'm sure, Gina, you know about some other ones that I, that I don't know about. Yeah, there there was one uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, the the women of uh, I think it's Sigma Gamma Rho hosted something, but I believe they're going to be doing it again. And then the state had if you go to the Secretary of State's page, they have a hub that lists all of the notaries that are there um, that are around. And I think you might be able to do it by your address to find a notary near you. Okay, good. Good. So keep an eye out th there. There are some ways to, to have that done. Um, I want to touch uh, quickly on uh, the voter ID law in Missouri. 2016, uh, voters uh, approved the measure requiring photo voter ID. There have been challenges to that law over the last several years. Where do we stand right now on what voters are required to have when they show up in person uh, to vote? The photo ID law is gone. It's dead. Okay. It's buried completely. So, you know, we definitely don't need a restrictive photo ID law that creates a huge burden. I mean, because that law not only required a photo ID, but it had to be a valid and current photo ID. And I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but I have, you know, blown the driver's license renewal deadline a few times. You know, you have it for so many years, you kind of forget. So that's a problem that many people could face um, with the burden uh, of a restrictive photo ID law, but luckily we don't have that anymore. And we're kind of back at the same thing that Missouri's done for a long time. Um, you know, there are a variety of IDs to choose from. And that was one of the things I remember before that that law was voted on is that Missouri actually had a pretty fair system. Uh, and we, I guess we do now too, where mm -hmm. uh, uh, the local board of elections may send out a card or you could bring in a utility bill or mm -hmm. things along those lines that, that could prove who you were. And it was a way to have some identification, but it wasn't overbearing. Uh, so, so. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And that's why people should be careful and not talk about these laws as voter ID laws. They're photo ID laws and they're restrictive photo ID laws because we already have voter ID in Missouri and we always have at least as long as I've lived here. And what are some other concerns about uh, the pandemic right now when it comes to voting? What are some other things that could pop up as we get closer to election day? With COVID and having um, a lot of your polling places will probably close. I just, I think I just recently got a list of all the polling places for August and they'll probably be the same for November. But yeah, polling places that, that have closed. So that's one issue, which, which forces a greater number of people to be at, at one particular poll place. And if you can imagine, if one polling place holds a thousand people, but a couple of places close, they could easily have four or 5,000 people trying to vote in one location. So with COVID, we're talking about people being protected, again, handling documents and, and things like that. So it's gotta be tough, not to mention the fact that you have people that prefer to vote in person. They, they're afraid of absentee voting, afraid of mail-in voting. They've been, there's this myth that it doesn't count. So um, I think that people should should know that if they if they're not willing to do absentee voting or not willing to do mail in voting that they need to make sure that they wear masks that they um, expect to stand in line for a long time because they will be you know and and then with a big press even without covid i think you know people you know in certain areas would have to stand in line for a long time because we just, you know, the Board of Elections just doesn't have all the equipment it necessarily needs to support a lot of things because anything can happen. But the big piece is if you're going to vote, be prepared to stand in line and make sure that you're protected. Okay, good. So it sounds like you are actually, you, you are recommending that folks 
attempt to vote by mail or absentee if they can this year? If, if they can, I would, but I don't want to force anybody into that. You got to go with what's comfortable for you, I think. And if it, you feel more comfortable going and pressing that button or doing a, a paper ballot, I think you should. I, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, I wouldn't let other people intimidate you, you know, by saying things like, you know, if you don't think you're going to be safe, then don't go. No, we want you to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there there will be groups that are going to um, make sure that people have water. You know, there'll, there'll be people out there to help and watch and do as much as possible um, because we're up against a lot. I agree with that, Gina, but I do think it's important for people, you know, to weigh the benefits and risks. And, and the mailing issue, I think, is a legitimate concern. So people should know that they have other options for voting um, this year that, you know, can include voting absentee in person or voting in person on Election Day. Dr. McClendon, uh, you recently were part of a research and author of a report called Will I Be Able to Cast My Ballot? Race, Income, and Voting Access on Election Day. And you looked at inequalities in the process itself and how things are set up. What are some of the other obstacles that that people can run into when when trying to vote in in the city of St. Louis and in St. Louis County? Well, so you know, so with this study, we we looked at 20 different poll locations. So we did 10 in the city, 10 in St. Louis County. Then we divided that those 10 by high income um, whites, high income blacks, low income whites and blacks. And what we found unanimously and consistently was that there were higher police presence in the, the poll places where there were more blacks and where there were lower income. There were more uh, chances that you stood in line longer, whether you were outside waiting to get in or whether you were waiting to get in on inside. Um, there were more machine malfunctions, fewer voting machines. Uh, just um, there were more presence of people with the sample ballots that you know, kind of makes you wonder what what that's about. I don't know. It's important to understand that. And I say that because where I've lived here in St. Louis, I never experienced, even never experienced that. Even when we had a big turnout for uh, when Barack Obama ran for office the first time, there were tons and tons of people. In my community, I didn't, I may have stood in line 20 minutes, but I went to a volunteer someplace to help out. And people were standing in line for hours, hours. And it never occurred to me that it was, that that was happening to people. And now it's, 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 it's going to be worse, in my opinion. It, you know, no matter what we, what we try to do, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be taxing. Because here's the other thing. There aren't enough poll workers. The average age of poll workers is about 70 years old. So now we're talking about, and not to knock 70 year olds, I'm not that far from 70, but you know, when you know, you're talking about new systems, new way of thinking about things, things like that. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little challenging sometimes it could be there for them. But if you don't have enough poll workers in the first place, which is going to be an issue because people are going to be afraid to be a poll worker. So, um, I would say if you're willing to be a poll worker, willing to be a notary, um, willing to just come out at poll places and just, you know, provide water or whatever kind of assistance you can give, I would, I think that would help the process of being able to, to vote in person. But yeah, but, but the research was, um, the findings were a little daunting. Okay, thank you for sharing that. And uh, Jennifer, I'll, I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, What are organizations like uh, St. Louis Area Voter Protection Coalition going to be doing on election days to to help things along? So Missouri, for a long time, thanks to Denise Lieberman, has had a program called Election Protection that is associated with the Voter Protection Hotline 866-HOUR-VOTE. And it has grown so much over the past few years since its inception. Um, In 2018, it was one of the largest programs ever with hundreds of volunteers in the field at polling places, attorneys working at command centers, and we even had um, signs with the hotline number placed at every polling place um, in the city and county, and uh, maybe St. Charles County too. Um, And we're working to expand that. I I helped Denise because I, I, I do 
the metro area kind of with election protection and help organize volunteers here. And there are also, you know, organizers in other parts of Missouri and, you know, Kansas City. We're trying to get it to be a, a completely statewide thing. Now, you know, one caveat is it's a little more complicated this year because the model that we've used in the past of a big command center with attorneys sitting around sharing tables and people going out in person to polling places and handing out flyers and talking to voters is a little more difficult than it was. So many of the things will occur remotely. It's still happening. We still need attorneys to volunteer. We need, and we need people to volunteer if they feel comfortable going out in the field, people to volunteer to put up the polling place signs to show the 866R vote hotline. And also people to be um, not only roving poll monitors where they sort of drive around and check things out and, and file reports so they don't have to get out of their car or have any contact, but also people to monitor social media for the reports, anecdotes, you know, whatever people saying, wow, I had to wait in line for five and a half hours today, you know, making sure that all that gets all that data gets collected. And so with that said, first of all, if you have any questions or problems about voting, please call the hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. It's important that people do that because when problems are documented, you can identify the you know, groups of problems or, or common problems and take action. In 2018, it was discovered that St. Charles County was wrongly asking for photo ID at the polling place. And because so many people called the hotline, the attorneys were able to kind of, you know, put together a pattern of behavior and file a successful lawsuit against St. Charles County Election Board. So it's really, really important for people to report their problems. Even if the problems were resolved, please report them to the hotline. And then if folks want to volunteer, either as an attorney or one of the kind of field volunteers, you can go to protectthevote.net. Or you can text our vote O U R V O T E to six six eight six six, and okay. both of those will let you sign up to be an election protection volunteer. Please. Okay, great. There are so many things to talk about when it comes to voter protection in the state of Missouri, and so many things changing all the time. We are going to have to cut our conversation short today, but I'd love to have you guys uh, talk about things uh, as maybe even after our election process this year about where do we go from here? What do we do to try to expand voting in Missouri? Uh, we talked a little bit about Unlock the Vote, but what are some of the other goals we might be looking at? So thank you for joining me today, first of all. Oh, thanks for having us. And Thank again, you. Uh, I've, my guests today were Jennifer Lohman of the St. Louis Area Voter Protection Coalition and Dr. Gina McClendon, the Director of the Voter Access and Engagement and Financial Capability and Asset Building Initiatives at the Center for uh, the School of Development in the Brown School at Washington University. To learn more about MCU or Metropolitan Congregations United and our activities, go to our website of MCU stlewis.org and also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for news and events and we'll keep you contacted with events going on this, uh, regarding voting. I'm Kevin Prang and you have been listening to This Is What Democracy Sounds Like. Tune in again next time and thank you for listening.